Okay, I'm not sure we're going to gain too many more right now. So I'm going to launch into our webinar this morning on marketing restrictions across Europe, lessons for implementation. My name is Stein. I'm the Director of Policy at the World Obesity Federation, and I'll be chairing this morning. I've had a long-term interest in marketing to children for at least 30 or probably nearer 50 years, um, including my own children, of course, and they're in their 30s. So uh, this is a theme that is quite important, and we've made some significant progress over the years, but there's still a way to go. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we, you might notice that our branding is slightly changing. We've got a flash new website, which is still evolving, but you'll see there's new branding there with a slightly changed uh, logo and some bigger pictures and lots of fun and games. Um, we, we are introducing the topic now. So what have we got? We've got marketing restrictions across Europe, lessons for implementation. Now, this is part of our uh, operating grant that we have received from the European Union or European Commission as part of their third health program, and they're helping to support us on policy issues like these, uh, for which we're very grateful. Uh, hence the logo at the top of the uh, page you're seeing there. Okay, uh, the emphasis today is on digital marketing, and I'd like to just run through the agenda quickly with all of you. And um, we'll see what we've got coming up. Firstly, I'm very pleased to say that Emma Boyland, University of Liverpool, one of the world's leading experts on uh, marketing to children, who's done years of research in this area and published many papers, will be able to join us uh, as soon as I've stopped speaking. Um, and she's, in fact, we've given her two slots because she's been working closely with the World Health Organization in the region. Uh, for developing guidance on marketing and updating the World Health Organization on their data. So she's been working very hard on that. So we'll ask her first to speak about the rationale for regulatory action, why we should do something, um, and then we'll take a couple of questions and then ask Emma to give us a second piece on evaluating uh, guidance on marketing to children. Uh, after that, we'll move on and take three case studies. Uh, we're very lucky to have Catherine Riley from the Irish Heart Foundation um, talking about the Irish approach where they've managed to um, restrict some digital marketing on the basis of the uh, data protection uh, for protecting children, the Data Protection Act. Uh, then we'll move on to Malcolm, Malcolm Clark from Cancer Research UK, who's been working on marketing issues for many years, both there and at his previous job at Sustain, uh, talking about the UK's uh, current position on marketing restrictions. And lastly, we're very lucky to have Sandro, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, Radosh Krenel from Slovenia talking on digital marketing and their experience there, which they've been developing largely on alcohol issues, but that has strong implications for uh, food issues as well. There'll be time for questions and answers, I hope. We hope to finish well before 11.30, that's London time, um, 12.30 Central European time. Um, and I urge you to use, if you move your mouse around, you'll see popping up at the bottom uh, options to uh, participate. And there's a Q&A button, and that's the one we would urge you to use. And that way we will get to see anything that you type in there, uh, and we can then uh, challenge the speakers with your questions. Okay, just to remind people to keep their microphones muted, please, because otherwise uh, it does interrupt what we're doing. Um, also, oh. Okay, popping back and forth. Uh, feel free to send in questions throughout. The Q&A button should be operative all the way through. Uh, it says here the chat box. Don't use the chat box because we may not be monitoring that. The Q&A function is the preferred one. Uh, and we are recording this uh, webinar for future use and for people to be able to access offline or online but not live uh, at a future date. So remind yourself that this is being recorded. Well, I think from me, and I'm going to be very happy now to pass over the microphone to Emma Boyland, Dr. Emma Boyland at uh, University of Liverpool, uh, to take us through the reasons why it is important that we address the issue of marketing to children. Emma. Hello, can you hear me? Hopefully. Um, so yes, asked, yes, we can, Emma. Thanks. Great. So I've been asked to talk about the rationale supporting regulatory action on food marketing. Um, because I have these two talks, um, the second one is a lot more focused around the child rights approach. So if 
what I'm going to set out here is the evidence of harm, that is that food marketing has a negative impact on children's diets. And between those two sort of levers that we have, I think we can uh, probably agree that there's a really strong evidence base to support action in this area. Uh, let's move to the next. Right, uh, there we go. So we know that children are preferentially targeted by marketers to a greater extent than any other demographic. And that's because children are known to have pocket money and independent spending power that they will often spend on things like snacks and confectionery. They also have a great deal of influence over the family spend. So for example, if you take a child to the, excuse me, go back, take a child to the uh, supermarket, you're likely to spend more and to be influenced by the demands that they make for particular branded products. And of course, children will grow up and ultimately be responsible for not only their own purchasing, but likely that of a wider family as well. And so if brands can obtain brand loyalty and really hook a child into their brand and their product at an early age, then they can uh, benefit from a lifetime of sales from that individual. So it's no accident that children are particularly recipients of marketing because that's exactly the group that, that marketers wish to grab hold of. But there's also this uh, element that children are particularly vulnerable to food marketing. Um, and I'm not a particular fan of the sort of media literacy angle of regulation because I don't think the emphasis should be on an individual to resist marketing. It should be um, a government-led protection of individuals who uh, are being negatively affected by food marketing. But I think it's important to establish that children are particularly vulnerable and therefore that food marketing is particularly exploitative when it's directed at them. And for younger children, we can think of this in terms of their lack of understanding of the persuasive intent of marketing. So that's that they don't recognize um, until they're much older that marketing is trying to sell them something, which is selling intent. And also that marketing will put forward the positive attributes of a product, but withhold the negative attributes in order to persuade. So we know that when foods are marketed, they will emphasize that it, if it has a vitamin component, um, but it will hold back the fact that it's high in fat and sugar. But children don't understand this and, and take the messages as a uh, fact. And that's difficult then for them to um, put up any form of barrier against being persuaded. But we also know that very young children have difficulty recognizing when they're being advertised to. Um, in broadcast media, um, there are at least clues and cues as to when marketing is happening. So, for example, there'll be a jingle, um, there'll be a break in the programming, and all sorts of Use like this to enable them to recognize when an advert is on. But in the digital world, that's becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, marketing is much more embedded into the, the content, and even older children have difficulty recognizing when they're being advertised or marketed to online. And if they're not able to recognize when this is happening, of course, they're not able to put up any form of defense at all. But I also think it's important to note that marketing restrictions shouldn't just focus on younger children because there are reasons why older children, despite their greater cognitive understanding and ability, are also vulnerable and more vulnerable to marketing. And that's based around the fact that, for example, teenagers are in a stage of life where they're really seeking to establish their identity and they use things like media and brands at the heart of that. Um, marketing is increasingly operating on a sort of unconscious emotional level. And of course, teenagers are particularly vulnerable to um, emotional connections. And brands seek to kind of uh, use that in order to grab their attention and to persuade them. Um, and uh, teenagers are also a particularly risk-taking demographic as well. We can't really expect a teenager to make a sort of sensible long-term health decision um, because it's just that time of life when you're most likely to make the um, most risky decision because you're sort of testing boundaries. And so I think that the evidence supports the fact that we should be looking to protect all children um, from marketing and not just younger children. If we look at what that evidence looks like, it supports the fact that there's a stepwise chain of events um, between marketing exposure and the sorts of health outcomes that we're all familiar with. So things like increased consumption and uh, greater body weight. 
And that's not to say that these steps operate in a sort of sequential form. They operate in tandem. Of course, exposure to marketing is constant. There's reinforcement at the point of sale. And so that the cumulative effect of this exposure would build and build over time rather than happening in sort of individual pattern as it's set out here. But I think this framework allows us really nicely to see how marketing can have an effect on a number of determinants of behavior. So things like awareness of products and brands, change in attitudes and normalization of those sorts of products as part of a, a typical diet. And then it leads through purchase and pester power through to the consumption of those products. Um, and the circles I've added on the top there suggest really where we're up to in terms of the evidence base that we've got quite a good uh, amount of evidence to show that food marketing affects consumption. We're starting to get some evidence now that it affects consumption in a way that's not compensated for later. Um, and I'll talk about some of that. And we've got less evidence that food marketing directly leads to weight gain and weight related disease. But that's not to say it doesn't happen. It's just very difficult to measure. And also there's the issue that diet quality in itself is related to health outcomes such as cancer. So it's not all via obesity, but of course, weight gain and obesity are really critical here. So the evidence shows that there's a, a number of those steps, um, evidences there already to support the impact of marketing on a number of those steps, I should say. So I've just picked out a few examples here in the interest of time, of course, uh, we can't cover everything. Um, but in terms of awareness, studies have shown that children are able to like, correctly identify um, sports and brands that are associated with each other through sponsorship. And the greater the child's interest in that particular sport, the more able they are to identify the correct sponsor. So they are recognizing and they are aware of those relationships. Generally, the children who are, uh, have greater commercial exposure have better and more positive attitudes towards unhealthy food. So they will diminish the negative aspects of eating unhealthy foods and play up the positive ones in line with the marketing that they've received. And we, of course, we know that children will show a greater preference for unhealthy marketed foods after exposure to that sort of advertising. And that even if they're not aware that they've been advertised to, their choice of the advertised products will increase. Um, in terms of consumption, this is a meta-analysis I published a couple of years ago now. Um, that basically summed all of the studies that um, have ever experimentally manipulated food advertising exposure, and that's either on TV or on the internet, and then measured intake afterwards and compared this to children's intake after non-food non advertising or no advertising at all. Um, all the studies to the right of the line on the, the forest plot there uh, showed that there was greater food intake immediately after food advertising exposure um, and anything to the left shows the opposite effect. And I think we can see that the, the magnitude of effect varies quite a lot, but there is a consistent pattern that food intake will be significantly greater after children are exposed to food marketing compared to non-food marketing or no marketing. And the statistics support that assertion. Uh, I mentioned the, the issue of compensation. So this is the idea that we're looking at energy balance across the course of a day. Um, and in order to make the case that food marketing would lead to weight gain, um, it's important to gather evidence to show that the compensation, um, sorry, the increase in intake we've just been discussing is not compensated for later, i.e. the children don't reduce their intake at the next meal to make up for the food they've just eaten as prompted by food advertising. And this is an Australian study that I was involved with um, where it was run at a summer camp at the research centre so that they were able to get a lot more um, meal intake measurements in than in a normal sort of acute study. And what this study found was that when children were exposed to food marketing on TV and the internet, they then consumed more at a subsequent snack as is consistent with those other studies that I've already mentioned but they also did not reduce their intake at lunch later on in the day so that they were consuming an additional 194 kilojoules of energy on the days when they'd been exposed to food advertising. And so it's clear that although this is an isolated experimental effect, this is only a very short exposure to advertising actually. And in the real world, children are exposed to this form of advertising, food day in, day out, 
Um, and we'd expect if that cumulative effect translates um, beyond these sorts of experimental settings, then it's clear to see how the increased intake could definitely support greater uh, weight gain and heavier weight status over time. Um, of course, we're talking about digital um, in this webinar because a lot of the evidence so far is based on TV, but we know that rather than replacing TV, digital is sort of adding on top as the multiple, I can't say that word, uh, an amplification, shall we say, of the effects. Um, and so what we're seeing in digital food marketing is uh, the evidence is a lot newer and a lot less um, spread purely because of the nature of digital marketing in that it's targeted behaviorally and contextually to the individual who's viewing it. So as public health researchers, we're not able to see what children see when they go online because we're not them. Um, but studies are starting to emerge where we're starting to get an idea. Um, and unsurprisingly, the main players that we would see advertising on TV are also very prominent online. All the major unhealthy um, food brands and beverage brands are there and they're marketing through social media. And as we saw with TV, the majority of the foods promoted are non-core or unhealthy foods. They're using a lot of different marketing strategies. And of course, digital lends itself to even more sophisticated marketing strategies than we're used to. Um, and the, the marketing campaigns are very focused on pushing the brand and less focus on um, promoting individual products and the constituents of those products. So it really is very similar to what we've seen with TV. Re recent studies have also shown that the level of engagement of children is important in how impactful that marketing is. So in this um, online survey from Australia, those children who watched food brand video content on YouTube reported that they had purchased foods online, reported that they'd seen their favorite food brands advertised online. All of those aspects were significantly associated with more frequent consumption of unhealthy foods and drinks. So here it's demonstrating that it's not just about children's exposure to that material online, but that their engagement with that material is important. And of course, we know that a lot of digital food marketing is focused on getting that engagement. It encourages children to share with their friends, to uh, bring ch other children on board to play an advert game in order to beat their score. It encourages them to download material such as Snapchat filters and then share that in their communications with their friends. And so the marketers are really grabbing hold of that facility for engagement and for peer network and for that sort of earned media that's more viral and, less, and ne not necessarily brand driven. Um, but they're seeking that sort of level of engagement to get their brand into these conversations with children. And these sorts of studies suggest that that is um, an effective way of marketing. Uh, we know less about the impact of digital marketing on eating behavior. As I say, it's sort of a, a relatively new area of research and a lot more difficult to um, manipulate in the way TV advertising is. Um, but these are a couple of studies that um, have been done by my PhD students at the University of Liverpool that are currently um, under review at journals. Um, and so what we've been able to demonstrate is that where social media influencers market foods, so that's these sort of YouTube video bloggers who have a, a great deal of followers, millions and millions of young people follow them on YouTube and through other social media platforms. When children are exposed to these social media influencers, um, mentioning products, holding up products in the, the images and endorsing those products, that has an impact on their eating behavior. And in the same way as we saw with television advertising, exposure to that sort of marketing online increases children's intake of unhealthy snack food particularly, um, but they also don't reduce their intake of other foods such that their, their total consumption is greater after that exposure. Um, the second study on the right, um, we actually looked at the concept, concept of ad disclosures. So that's this new regulatory proposal whereby um, these YouTube influencers have to disclose when they have a paid relationship with the, with the brand or the marketing company. And we found that actually when the um, video blog makes it clear that it's an advert, that's actually increased children's food intake. So it was a sort of a paradoxical relationship. 
what is meant to highlight advertising in order for children to defend themselves actually was the very thing that um, increasingly promoted their food intake. Um, so that's something that we need to explore. Um, just to, I'm aware I'm running out of time, but just to quickly mention a, a report that came out just last month um, to myself and Cancer Research UK, um, and it's a, a quantitative, cross-sectional, uh, nationally representative online survey. We had close to 2,500 parent-child dyads in the UK tell us about their media habits and about their um, pestering, purchasing, intake, and body weight. And really what we found reinforces all of these messages that we've seen in the experimental data. So those children who watch commercial TV for three or more hours per day were, had an increased likelihood of pestering their parents for junk food and the children confirmed that they were pestering as well as the parents. Um, and they were almost three times more likely to buy junk food and more, twice, more than twice as likely to eat many of the unhealthy food categories. And those effects weren't found for non-commercial TV. Um, so we're really isolating the fact that it's the commercial content that's important. And similar effects were found for children who use the uh, internet for reasons other than homework for those sorts of times per day. And interestingly there as well, we found that it um, reduces intake of healthy foods as well as promoting intake of unhealthy foods. Um, and so when we look across the, the broad scope of evidence that we have, we can't conduct these sort of randomized controlled trials to show that food advertising um, would lead to obesity. Uh, there's no way we can control um, children to the extent that they would be in a non-advertising exposure group in the same way you would in the drug trial. But this Bradford Hill criteria allows us to evaluate whether it's plausible that there is a, a causal relationship between food marketing and body weight outcomes. And across each of the requirements on the left there, the, the criteria for causality are met by the evidence that we have. There's repeated evidence that there's a strong association. It's experimental evidence where it's manipulated and the effect is shown. The dose response relationship, so the greater marketing exposure, the greater the effect. The effect is consistent across different types of study designs. Temporality means that the marketing exposure was first in an experimental study and the eating behavior came second. And it's a plausible and coherent argument to say that food marketing would lead to body weight gain. It makes sort of logical sense. And so we can be relatively confident on the basis of the evidence that there is a causal relationship between food marketing and obesity and weight gain in children. And I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Emma, that's really great, and thank you so much for that. Um, it's a fantastic introduction to our webinar today and summarizes a broad base of knowledge. If I understood co co correctly, um, we don't actually have evidence that links marketing right all the way through from the marketing to obesity in one clear study. Is that correct? That's correct. It's been modeled on the basis of projections from what we know about the acute effect on intake. You could say if, if that was um, modelled up to a, a population level, this would be the effect on obesity. But um, yeah, it's not just not possible to run a trial where you expose one group of children long term to advertising and restrict the other group long term enough to see effects on body weight to disaggregate the two. Yes, quite. I fully understand. It wouldn't be very ethical either. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and another comment is about literacy um, sort of trying to train children to be to immunize themselves as it were against the effects of advertising I've long held the view that um, the persuasive intent of advertising is actually largely subliminal and can't therefore be easily controlled and I sort of liken it to something like um, understanding how a gun works but if someone shoots at you knowing how it works won't make any difference at all you will still <laughs> still be harmed so um, also, I'm wondering if there's any evidence that literacy might actually encourage attention to advertising. And you did sort of hint at that in the one study you mentioned, uh, which would actually give greater potential effect rather than less. So I don't know if advertising literacy training might actually increase attention to advertising. Do you know of any evidence there? There's certainly that risk. Um, there are a couple of studies that have used um, warnings uh, ahead of advertising, saying things like, remember advertising is trying to persuade you or remember advertising is largely for unhealthy products that are not conducive to a healthy diet, etc. 
And they either have no effect at all, or as you say, they heighten children's attention to the fact that they're about to receive marketing and they focus in on the food cues. Um, so I'm not a big believer in that line of thinking for a couple of reasons. One, as we've just said, it's probably not that effective. Two, I don't think it's fair to expect young people to resist. Um, it's not the case. We wouldn't do that with anything else. We wouldn't expect them to just sort of walk away from other damaging online um, activities and it's digital and as you've said a lot of it increasingly now with digital a lot of it is deliberately um, delivered at the subconscious level uh, and so if they can't even recognize it um, how are they supposed to defend themselves and again the the food marketing defense model um, from Jennifer Harris at the Red Center supports the fact that they would need to be motivated to resist that marketing as well as have the ability uh, I'm not sure we can expect children to think in the kind of long-term health goals way that we uh, we do as adults. Fine. Just one short one has come in. Uh, do you think there's a role for marketing of healthy foods to young people through digital platforms? I think there is. I think it's um, beneficial to have the conversation about healthy food in the same way that we would have that conversation at home. However, studies tend to support the fact that advertising healthier foods does not have the same impact on healthy food consumption as advertising unhealthy foods. It's, it's more difficult to sell to children, shall we say, because there's not the innate preference for the, the sweetness and the fat necessarily. Um, and I'd also be concerned about pushing that line of thinking too much from the, the sense that we already see that there's a lot of marketing of healthier products by unhealthy food brands. Um, or brands that are particularly synonymous with unhealthy foods. Um, and so what we don't want to see is the market flooded with fast food companies advertising fruit bags, for example, as a solution to this. Okay, well, that's an excellent final comment. Emma, I'm now going to pass to Emma and ask you to, to pick up the cudgels again and um, give us a presentation now that orients us towards what the World Health Organization in the region uh, has been up to over the last couple of years. Uh, can I pass that back to you? And I think the slides should move straight forward uh, onto the next one. Okay, thank you very much. So apologies for listening to me again. Um, but I've been asked to give an overview of this report that was published just last month by the, the World Health Organization. Um, it's been eight years since the World Health Assembly unanimously adopted the WHO set of recommendations on the marketing of foods and non-alcoholic beverages to children. Um, and this report really seeks to set out where we've got to since then in the European region. And it offers some further guidance and support for member states in their regulatory actions. Um, so before I start fully, I'd like to thank and acknowledge all my co-authors on this report. So it's Amandine Gard at the University of Liverpool and Mimi Tatlow-Golden from the Open University, and uh, Joe Jewell and Joao Breda from um, the World Health Organization European office. Um, and the report is really a sort of true interdisciplinary endeavor. Um, and we really hope that because of this, it meets the needs of the many stakeholders and therefore can be a genuine contribution to moving policy forward in this area. Um, so in terms of the structure of the report, and therefore what I'll seek to cover um, in the time, briefly in the time I have available today. So it first summarises the evidence on the extent, nature and impact of food marketing, which obviously I won't go into again because we've just um, had that introduction. Uh, it then summarises the key points from the set of recommendations that really should guide and frame any policies made to address this problem. It then reviews the state of implementation in countries across Europe, and that's based on the best available evidence we could get from the global nutrition policy review alongside literature reviews and expert consultation. It then identifies the existing loopholes and ongoing challenges in implementing policy in this area and that draws on the evidence to offer guidance and quite specific guidance on how countries might formulate policies um, to uh, meet those challenges. And it then concludes by discussing the potential of a child's rights approach which is really at the heart of all this um, because states have a legal obligation to respect, protect and fulfil children's rights. And that's the right to the highest attainable standard of health, among other rights to do with um, access to food and data privacy that also um, are relevant to digital marketing regulations. And the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child really mandates states to ensure 
that the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration in all their actions. So I think it's quite clear from that wording how food marketing regulation is a key example of where that's particularly pertinent. Um, as I said, I won't reiterate the evidence, um, but just to say that the WHO model provided here really encapsulates the key components of marketing and therefore of the types of evidence we have. So it states that the impact of marketing on behavior is a function of exposure, which is the, the reach and frequency of the marketing message, and power, which is the creative content and the persuasive nature of that, that advertising. Um, and we have substantial evidence um, of all three of those things. Um, so it's the view of the World Health Organization and uh, the contributors to this report that the strength and composition of we have is such that there's a clear need for effective implementation of the recommendations um, to tackle this problem. I'm sure you're all familiar with the WHO set of recommendations, um, but the key aspects we wanted to reiterate in this report really that one, Reductions in both exposure and power are critical, and these should be sought um, because we've just seen both are impactful. And also marketing is not just advertising. Um, so policies should seek to cover other commercial communications, such as sponsorship, product placement, um, per point of purchase displays, product packaging, and all those other commercial communications that are also powerful influences over um, food purchase and consumption. And really just to emphasize that governments are key stakeholders um, in policy development and they need to set clear definitions in the policy so that the implementation of that policy can be uniform um, and be media neutral. Uh, and there's a need for cooperation with other member states um, to reduce the impact of cross-border marketing as well, because not everything can be dealt with at a national level. Um, the recommendations don't explicitly mention child rights, but given what we've just said about how um, they're formulated, I think it's clear that the recommendations support uh, child right, a child rights approach and that their comprehen comprehensive implementation is the best way of um, offering protection for children's health. So the two are aligned, even though they might not specifically refer to recommendations. So in terms of policy progress across the European region since 2010, um, just over half of the, the countries report having taken some steps to limit marketing of unhealthy food, um, which is positive, of course, um, but the implication of that is that just under half have taken no action at all. Um, and perhaps most policies do exist. They're often markedly insufficient to actually effectively reduce impact because they're often limited to just broadcast TV. Um, and we know that children receive marketing, marketing through a number of other channels and mechanisms, not least digital, that we're going to talk a lot about today. Um, the regulations are often limited to, um, within broadcast media, only child-directed programming. When we know children spend a lot of their viewing time outside of programming that's specifically made for them. Um, they often rely on self-regulation or co-regulation with the food industry, even though um, independent evaluations have shown this to be an ineffective um, method to reduce exposure. And as mentioned earlier, they're often um, limited to advertising and not marketing and those greater um, forms of commercial communication that exist. And therefore, broadly, we can say that the scope is often too narrow and the definitions are too limited to make a real difference to children's exposure. Um, in the interest of time, I think I can't really go into detail about all the policies exist uh, that, are in, that are in place at the moment. Um, so please refer to the report for, for more details of this. But just to say, in terms of regulating um, broadcast media, a uh, few countries have uh, specific legally binding regulations in place that are specific to high fat, sugar, salt, food marketing regulation. Portugal's is actually uh, under consideration, I believe, not finalised yet, but um, uh, the UK, Ireland and Turkey all have such regulation. Um, Sweden, Norway, Latvia, Lithuania and Slovenia also have some government-led specific um, regulation that's legally binding. Denmark um, doesn't have specific HFSS food marketing regulation, but does have general marketing or advertising regulation. Um, that includes some aspects that are relevant to HFSS, HFSS food marketing. 
And as I already mentioned, a number of countries um, rely on co-regulatory or self-regulatory codes. Um, and in some states, the, the EU pledge is the only relevant code. Um, but the weaknesses of that, that pledge to actually affect change are, are quite well documented. Um, some countries have also brought in rules to cover marketing in digital and uh, other non-broadcast media. Uh, the UK and Ireland have both recently taken action in this sphere in a sort of similar way. And the UK is an interesting example here because um, this summer we had the first rulings from the Advertising Standards Authority who enforce those codes. Um, and that gives us some interesting insight into the sort of way in which food marketing in a digital sphere can be regulated. Um, and it shows really some of the challenges in regulating digital marketing, particularly the importance of clear definitions in policy, as already mentioned. And this gets to the heart of the matter, really, about the matter of targeting, which speaks to the motivation of the manufacturer. And this is actually less important, in my view, than exposure um, in terms of what generates impact. So it doesn't really matter whether that marketing is intended to be received by a child or not. If they're exposed to it and it's persuasive, it will have an impact on their eating behaviour. And so it's important that um, regulations take that into account. There are... Um, a few examples of marketing restrictions that operate beyond media, so beyond broadcast and um, non-broadcast media. Some exist for schools, um, but the WHO recommendations go broader than schools. They speak about settings where children gather, um, and it's clear that that's broader and includes, is, is meant to encompass things like recreation facilities and leisure centres, and very few states um, tackle that. Uh, fewer than 20% of member states have policies uh, specifically to tackle marketing and those sorts of settings. Um, and so that's a real um, area for, for development. Um, and there are things like, as I said before, in-store promotion, street billboards, packaging and sponsorships that are really very, very rarely dealt with. Um, Brand marketing is another issue. So many existing policies, whether they're legally binding or based on self-regulation, focus on product advertising and exclude brand advertising. But we know that the evidence supports the fact that brand imagery is very, very powerful and can still influence behavior. Um, it's challenging to identify an HFSS brand um, because of course there'll be a portfolio of products that that brand will offer. Um, but the UK regulation speaks to um, marketing that has the effect of promoting specific high fat sugar salt products. Um, which is interesting, and was actually used to uphold a complaint against Kellogg's recently, who um, sought to market uh, one of their healthier cereals, but still using the yellow branding and the, the monkey from Cocoa Pops advertising. And it was found that they had violated the code by using brand imagery that's so synonymous with the high sugar product, even if the actual product being advertised was healthier than that. Um, so there's some action here, but it's an area um, of concern and an area where more action needs to be taken. Um, and of course, one of the real issues with marketing, particularly with digital, is that even when national regulations exist, um, and if they're effective, it, that can be undermined by marketing received um, by media from originating in an, a neighbouring state. The WHO recommendations really urge cooperation to ensure that this doesn't occur. Um, and there are provisions in the audio media, uh, Audiovisual Media Services Directive particularly Article 9 that refers to um, marketing of HFSS foods to children. Um, narrow in scope, although um, a recent revised version um, is an improvement as it doesn't um, limit to child-oriented programming only. Um, but there are also provisions within that directive that speak to um, maintaining the rights of free movement within that, that EU market. And so there are sort of barriers to using that, that directive in order to support marketing restrictions. But it's clear that if marketing restrictions can happen at the EU level, at least for some categories um, of communications, then this would be an effective way of, of tackling the problem. Um, and I won't mention Brexit. Um, most of these I've already mentioned, but just to say the report gives um, clear guidance that a child should be considered as someone under the age of 18 and not just someone under 12. Uh, as mentioned earlier, teens can still be very vulnerable. Um, marketing should not be considered just what's directed at children, but what they're exposed to. 
um, and that there's a need to identify an evidence-based mechanism to categorise which foods and beverages um, a nation would wish to restrict. And there are nutrient profile models that are particularly um, uh, evidence-based to support that, including one from the WHO that sets out a sort of a framework that can then be um, adjusted in, and adapted in accordance with the cultural needs and diets of individual member states. Um, I'm running out of time, so very quickly, um, Article 24 of the United States Convention on the Rights of the Child mandates parties, as I said earlier, to respect, protect and fulfil the child rights to the highest attainable standard of health. It does take, in other, it does take into account other factors um, other than uh, uh, marketing, of course, but it says that states should provide the opportunity for every child to achieve this. Um, so it's suggesting that not just any standard of health, but the highest attainable standard of health, and that they should use whatever tools they have with um, to allow children to achieve that. And it's important, the benefits of a child's rights approach is that it imposes legal obligations on states. So this guarantees a degree of state accountability, which makes remedies much more likely where children's rights have been violated. And therefore, a child's rights approach really effectively supports effective implementation, monitoring and enforcement of the, second, of the set of recommendations. Um, and so just to summarise that, there's been slow progress so far. The evidence supports that we need greater action and states need to do more, particularly to protect child rights so that we can achieve that healthier food environment across the WHO region. And I'd just like to thank my co-authors on this report um, and say that it's available now on the WHO website. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Emma. That's been a, a, a rapid but very helpful run through what the WHO has been getting up to and some of the thinking behind it. And I'm grateful for that. We are running a little over time, so I'm going to um, ask you to um, bear with us and not face any more questions and answers. And my apologies to people who've sent in questions. Um, but I think we do need to push on with our webinar today. I noticed that the slides will not only be available afterwards, but Emma's slides includes her email address. So please contact Emma if you have specific questions that you feel she can answer, or come back to us if there are some general questions that you think we may be. So I'm now going to um, bring in Catherine Riley from the Irish Heart Foundation. Uh, in the hopes that she can share with us her experience of using the data protection regulations uh, in the context of protecting children and restricting marketing, particularly digital marketing. So, Catherine, over to you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I suppose just it's very hard to follow Emma, but I'll try and do my best and just talk about how in Ireland we use the transposition of the GDPR um, directive into our own Data Protection Act and how we try to use that opportunity um, to get in a protection for children. So I suppose everyone's familiar with the GDPR at this stage. Um, the key purposes of the Data Protection Act as implemented in Ireland was obviously to give further effect to the GDPR in areas that was member state flexibility um, and so it was transposed into national law. And it aimed to regulate the processing of personal data and creating parameters around its acquisition, use, storage, and sharing. So the Data Protection Act in Ireland, or the Data Protection Bill, I suppose, it was published in February 2018. And before it was signed into law by um, the Irish President on the 24th of May, it actually underwent significant amendment. And it was probably one of those very controversial pieces of legislation um, in Ireland at the time. But I suppose we were able to exploit that um, and I'll explain that as we go on. So I want to touch on why the Data Protection Bill specifically and why we tried to use it as a vehicle um, considering it's a piece of it's justice legislation as opposed to health um, or from the Department of Communications which would traditionally be concerned with um, the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland and in terms of the advertising standards. So just to start, just to give it a bit of context, um, the text of Article 6F of the GDPR states that the legitimate interest of the data controller may be overridden by the interests or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject, which require protection of personal data, in particular where the data subject is a child. So it is clear that the drafters of the regulations anticipated the need for explicit protections for children. And I suppose following on from 
what Emma was talking about in terms of the, the children's rights perspective, we were trying to exploit these particular provisions. And then furthermore, um, where children are concerned, recital two, Recital 71 states that in particular children should not be subject to profiling that results in legal or similar significant effects. So essentially influencing the child's choices and behaviours in a potentially significant and harmful way. So the Working Party 29 bases this express protection for children on their view recited in tw recital 20, um, 20, er, 38 there, um, which is on your screens, which state that children merit specific protection with regard to their personal data as they may be less aware of the risks, consequences and safeguards concerned and their rights in relation to processing of personal data. Um, such specific protection should in particular apply to the use of personal data of children for the purposes of marketing or creating personality or user profiles and the collection of personal data with regard to children when using services off or directly to a child. So this is all particularly relevant to how children are targeted online for advertising. Um, and that's why we tried to use this legislation um, and the transposition of it, because there was so much referenced in it, but it was just a matter of how can we actually insert these protections into the data protection bill, which did not con um, have anything around this specifically as yet. So how did we go about amending the bill? And the best way to kind of paint a picture of how we went about this was to give a bit of a timeline and how situation and circumstances actually played into our favour and set the context. So just to give a bit of detail here, in April 2018, members of the Irish Heart Foundation actually were presenting at an Oireachtas Committee on Childhood, um, on Children Youth Affairs, they were, do they were doing a report on childhood obesity. And obviously at the time, um, Cambridge Analytica was very topical. So the basis of a lot of our presentation at the time was um, how the Cambridge Analytica style tactics were actually being used to target children and um, you know drawing parallels between the tactics used by them to influence presidential election, Brexit and um, but how we, we were actually saying well these these tactics that are now so public and are being lamented in public discourse they've, they've been used for years to bombard children with advertising messages for unhealthy food and drinks and then in May um, we started to try and lobby politicians who were discussing this data protection bill to insert an amendment to ban the micro-targeting of children. So um, there was a number of proposed amendments to the bill seeking to micro-targeting um, and profiling of children by marketers, but at, initially at the committee reading um, they were rejected because our Justice Minister was... Um, was telling commission members that it would be in breach of EU law going further than what was allowed under GDPR. Then um, at report stage of the bill, um, following intensive lobbying on our behalf, we did a lot of work with um, a legal team. We were providing expertise. We actually managed to get politicians on board with the principle so an amendment was finally inserted in the bill um, after being supported by the largest opposition party in um, Ireland, which currently is supporting the government in its minority government through a confidence supply agreement. So it was actually critical to get their support um, because they were really the deciding factor in getting this inserted. So then in May 2018, we um, became the first country to ban micro-targeting. Our, our president signed the bill into law um, although the section dealing with micro-targeting um, wasn't commenced at the time, and um, it currently isn't commenced because they were seeking advice from the Attorney General, the fact is that the principle of protecting children from marketing excesses is actually enshrined in our law. It's on our statute books. And just, I uh, will discuss this further in later slides, but in June, um, the Department of Justice got a letter from the European Commission on the legislation and how it relates to GDPR if it goes further. And the European Commission said that they don't oppose the principle. They did suggest amendments to make it fully compliant, but the fact is that it, it, it doesn't oppose the principle um, that we got inserted into the legislation. So it just opens up app, um, opportunities um, for us then to just amend the legislation and to get the section commenced. 
so I suppose what set us apart, we were very fortunate um, in that Cambridge Analytica was so topical, it was a catalyst, it made the situation real to politicians. Um, you know, we were able to use the, 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 the scenario that if this is happening to um, adults voting, the voting public in terms of elections to such great effect, um, such global effect, and look at the ramifications of um, Cambridge Analytica tactics in terms of those elections and Brexit, look at what's happening to kids and then the subsequent effect on public health and their health. Um, so we were able to provide loads of information to parliamentarians. We were lucky that we have um, legal support in terms of an organisation that are very much um, specialising in digital rights and they have taken many um, cases um, in, in terms of this area and we were able to do a um, significant amount of political lobbying and it did help that it was such a complicated piece of legislation and um, that we were able to provide that, that expertise. So this is what Section 30 looks like at, at present. Um, it hasn't been commenced, as I said, um, but the, the, the rationale behind it is that it does aim to protect children from the effects of direct marketing and profiling. Um, and as we know, like no one could have anticipated how effectively children would be targeted as consumers. Um, and we see that um, oversight is minimal and barriers to oversight are systemic. Now, I just need um, to highlight and to put a caveat into this. This isn't the original text that the Irish Heart Foundation had provided to legislators. Um, we found that between the committee stage and the report stage, um, the drafter of the, the, the parliamentarians that we have been working with had changed the, legis had changed the amendment to this. Um, and that was a bit problematic, but we were, rather than oppose this amendment and take, get it taken out altogether, we were more concerned with trying to get the principle into the legislation and to concentrate our efforts on that. So the importance of Section 30, as it is, is that companies will now have known it's placed upon them to ensure the profiling of the child for marketing purposes um, is prohibited. Um, and we know that it's not sufficient to rely upon parental consent to protect children's data from exploitation and aggressive marketing techniques. And while this was going on um, in terms of Data Protection Act um, or Data Protection Bill, there was a lot of talk about the digital age consent. So there was a lot of public awareness about this issue. And I suppose, again, that was why we were able to get this in. Um, or get this in because again, you know, we're saying that children are experiencing difficulties in recognising commercial messages um, and, and adults as well. And as we've seen that, as I said, with Cambridge Analytica. So <laughs> section 30, it's, it's not all smooth sailing, as I mentioned. Despite being signed into law in May 2018, um, section 30 hasn't been commenced as yet. So um, the rationale for that, and just give an update. So the issues at the minute um, with our with the Department of Justice, GDPR, and our Constitution, and the problems I suppose um, the centre on the term micro targeting, and that what is in that specific Section Thirty Amendment that I showed you goes beyond um, the GDPR, and um, in, in terms of micro targeting, the issue there is around the constitutionality. There ha there's no reference to micro-targeting anywhere in our Irish domestic law and it wouldn't be constitutional to create an offence for something that hasn't been referred to. I'm not a legal expert so I can't go into too much detail on it um, but yeah so they, they mentioned that the offence of micro-targeting is not specifically mentioned in GDPR so that's why it needs to be amended. But as I said earlier, hope is not lost. You can't really see this very clearly, but this is a letter that the Department of Justice here got back from the European Commission in relation to the section and how it could be, um, you know, how it could work into the future. Um, as I said, it is going to require min minor amendment. But previously, our Minister for Justice, when asked if legislation could be introduced to put the onus on social media companies in that Oireachtas Committee on Children and Youth Affairs hearings on cyber security, um, he actually said, yes, I, I think we can do more in that area and I think we should explore it. 
So in response, as I said, um, in that letter to the Department of Justice, the European Commission clarified that as set out in Recycle 38 of the GDPR, children merits special protection, and in particular where the personal data of children is being used for marketing or creating personality of user profiles. Um, while it does say that direct marketing to children is a permissible activity under the GDPR, this provision must be balanced with the interests or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject, which require protection of personal data, in particular where the data subject is a child. Um, so there is a way around this, and that's what we are currently exploring. So there is a bit of momentum behind this as well. When we look, um, I know Emma mentioned the new revised audio, audiovisual media services directive, and um, also then the, the committee of ministers' recommendation in July earlier this year. So yeah, so the, the rights of children in the digital environment, it's been given explicit consideration by the Council of Europe's committee of ministers, and a set of recommendations for action have been provided to member states. And in recommendations published in July 2018, European governments have been recommended to review their legislation, policies and practices to ensure that these adequately address the full range of the rights of the child. Then, as we talked about the Audiovisual Media Service Directive, um, the, the version that's been passed by the European Parliament, um, it, the, the, the European Parliament negotiators secured a personal data protection mechanism for children, imposing me measures to ensure the data collected by audiovisual media providers are not processed for commercial use, including for profiling and behaviourally targeted advertising. So what's going to happen to our section 30? <laughs> that is the million dollar question going forward. So this is now the new wording that the Irish Heart Foundation have drawn up and that we have presented to, again, that main opposition party and another member of parliament. We do need amending legislation to amend the Data Protection Act as it is. So we're drawing up currently a Data Protection Amendment Bill 2018 or 2019. Um, this wording that I have in front of you, it's consistent with the wording of Article 22 of the GDPR and the rights and restrictions that it does introduce. So changing the wording from an offence to unlawful um, is going, will make it easier for the data subject to vindicate his or her rights under the Data Protection Act and through the courts as provided in section 128 of the Act and it removes any discussion of whether an offence has been lawfully created. So as I said we worked with our legal team on this. So we're looking at this amending legislation, we have um, provided this new um, compliance section and we're just um, working with the main opposition party to draft and table the legislation but it is going to be a bit of a waiting game um, considering uh, the, the negotiations in terms of the mi minority government here and then obviously everything with Brexit that is going on. So um, just our learnings, we were able to exploit the legislative opportunity and we used the GDPR transposition as a chance to pursue our agenda. We did have to explain it in great detail. There was a lack of understanding around many of these issues, but we gave politicians the answers and we tried to make it as easy as possible for them. Um, so it is going to be an interesting couple of months to see how we go forward with that. I'm sorry for running over time. Sorry, I, I was muted. That's really <laughs> fantastic, Catherine. An excellent presentation running through what is obviously a long and complex journey you've been through. Um, and what's more, I think on behalf of other advocacy organisations, we want to thank the Irish Heart Foundation for the investment they've put into this and the trouble they've gone to to push this through and in particular to to um, undertake all the legal work which is costly uh, and to get that letter from the European Commission which will be helpful to anyone else who wants to work in this field of using the data protection uh, push the children's protection further forward. Um, I don't think any questions have actually come up on the Q&A board and we are running over time so um, if people do have questions for Catherine, then we can always pass them on to her. Uh, I don't think her email was on this slide, so uh, we can always pass them on to her through Hannah, uh, who's been in touch with you all, I think, here at Hannah Brinsden here at the World Obesity Federation. So thank you, Catherine. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Malcolm Clark, uh, currently at the Cancer Research UK um, and formerly from the Children's Food Campaign, where he made a reputation for himself campaign campaigning on children's marketing issues. And Malcolm will talk us through the UK's journey of restricting digital marketing 
of unhealthy foods. So, Malcolm, over to you. Uh, morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes? Yep, I can. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so, I'm just trying to work out how to uh, manipulate the slide on my laptop, on my iPad. So, um, bear with me. You should be able to use the arrows up and down on your keyboard. Do you want to just, uh, if not, we will move it forward for you. Yeah, I'm on an iPad and I can't, it kind of oh. doesn't seem to work, so it's fine. It's my technology. Um, Someone yeah. did that. Oh, Was that us? That's fine. If not, I'll, um, I'll let um, uh, Hannah do it for me. Yeah, um, okay, just okay. shout. Yeah. Um, so just a reminder about why Cancer Research UK is in this space. Uh, looking at junk food marketing um, is because obesity is the second biggest preventable cause of uh, cancer after smoking. 670,000 uh, cases of cancer could be linked to obesity uh, by 2035 and uh, being overweight can cause you know, 13 types of cancer. So this is why we as Cancer Research UK are, it, are, are uh, are working uh, to, to reduce obesity and looking at a number of policy areas, but particularly uh, focusing on junk food marketing. Uh, next slide. Oh, brilliant. So um, our main focus at Cancer Research UK has been on the on the TV side, uh, but also we are now increasingly looking at the, the online side and I'm uh, drawing on also my experiences, as you said, with Children's Food Campaign. So in the UK, we have uh, a system where uh, the government through the Department for Digital, Cultural, Media and Sport uh, decides the regulation on TV. They mainly have it through Ofcom, um, with some co-regulation through the, the industry self-regulator, the Committee of Advertising Practice or the Broadcast Committee of Advertising Practice, and on digital, that's actually hyped almost exclusively down to the, the, the industry self-regulator, the Committee of Advertising Practice, or, or write the code and the, uh, the Advertising Standards Authority, which are, which are the ones that uh, actually uh, deal with the complaints uh, of the AO uh, and how that code is implemented. Uh, next slide. Um, so in terms of uh, you know, where, where we've got up to in the evolution, uh, things really kicked off, uh, oh gosh, we're talking over seven, seven and a half years ago, when the Committee of Advertising Practice extended their remit and the code uh, that they were looking at to include online advertising um, and for the Advertising Standards Authority um, to then look at uh, that, uh, to be able to implement and, and adjudicate on rulings relating to online digital advertising. Um, there followed numbers of years of uh, campaigning, um, and I'll explain a bit about that in a minute, to the point where we had new uh, regulations, new thought regulations, new rules, sorry, brought in uh, by the Committee of Advertising Practice uh, for, for their non-broadcast rules. Uh, so this isn't, this isn't legislation, this is, this is still industry co-regulation um, uh, and self-regulation, as it were, which had um, uh, new rules brought in and uh, almost a year later, so the middle of this year, we had the uh, government, a uh, UK government agreeing to consult on further marketing restrictions and I guess it's regulatory restrictions, uh, legal restrictions. We, and we haven't yet had that, um, uh, that consultation, but it's due out in December, um, potentially implementing in uh, 2020. So next slide. Um, so before 2017, so since the old rules, um, and this is what I looked at a lot in my, in my previous job, you know, they failed to adequately reduce the appeal to the exposure of children to, uh, to advertising for less healthy foods online. There were lots of loopholes uh, and the failing to cover many common marketing techniques and the rules were, were vague and inconsistently applied. So uh, next slide, uh, we got new rules, I say after lots of campaigning, new rules, yeah, which came in in July last year and these rules were 
you know, apply it to all marketing targeted, at, uh, uh, all non-broadcast marketing targeted at under 16s, you know, particularly banning the advertising of HMSS food or drink um, in online children's media. And this included ads that directly or indirectly through brand advertising, HMSS brand advertising promoted an HMSS product. Ads that couldn't appear in media where children make up over 25% of the audience. Um, and also restrictions on the use of promotions and licensed characters and celebrities popular with children uh, for HMSS products. Next slide. Um, don't have time to go into detail of, of the rules, but um, I mean, the key thing is it was about content that was explicitly directed at children, it had this audience threshold of 25%, so it only kicked in where the audience was perceived to be more than 25% children uh, of that particular site or, or advert. Uh, and um, but what it did say was the onus is on the advertiser to take steps to try and. Um, uh, stop the targeting and not be seen to be targeting uh, certainly large groups of uh, under 16s. Next slide. So thanks to particularly the persistence of uh, 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 colleagues at the Obesity Health Alliance and uh, uh, Children's Food Campaign and Sustain, a number of rulings have been put in place, uh, yeah, a number of complaints were, were put in since July 2017. They take many, many, many months to, to work through the Advertising Standards Authority system. Um, but finally, over the last sort of few months this year, we've, got, we've started to get some of these rulings. And I think it's quite instructive to see what, what, what's got through, what hasn't, what, what, what's been upheld, you know, where, where, what, what hasn't. So some of the uh, upheld rulings, I mean, I basically list, listed some of the key things, again, I mean, more time to, to follow through the, the links to, you know, in your own time, see the actual adverts, but the, um, the key things on the Cadbury's one, you know, where content, you know, a storybook and a pack specifically created, you know, as content for children, even though adults were, in a sense, viewing that site, because that was content that was then seemed to be downloaded for children's use, um, promoting chocolate, um, it was, uh, you know, it was deemed uh, an HMSS ad uh, targeting children and, uh, and not allowed to be shown again. Um, same again, Stuart's Facebook page, um, numbers of different uh, posts, you know, really targeting in their language and their, you know, back to school, exam results, school libraries, um, um, the brand equity, even though no product was shown, the brand equity character was deemed to be HSS. And also interestingly, because some of the likes and shares were from under 16 year olds and they then shared it with their friends, that was seen as being again a bad thing. And uh, by the Advertising Standards Authority and likewise, um, you know, Chewitz uh, didn't take any of the steps on age or interest-based factors that were available to the brand to, to kind of say, well, we haven't targeted it under 16s. Next slide. Again, there's a, there's a couple more um, uh, examples, but really it's kind of, you know, where age gating, you know, squashes at, at where age gating was uh, insufficient, um, you know, where, you know, something being driven from the packaging uh, to an ad for game online, where the, because the sweet was being um, used as a, um, because you know, the sweet was being consumed by many children, or by you know, largely by children, um, it was seen that then they were the ones who'd be downloading the app and using the app. So that was seen as targeting children. And lastly, Kinder Surprise marketing. Again, some really good stuff there on actually brand advertising and uh, including the you know, where in QR codes driving, you know, seen as an additional you know, promoter of HMSS and, uh, and therefore you know, not allowed either uh, on something targeted at children. Um, next slide. But we didn't win everything, and some of the key things that we haven't won, you know, these are two of them, on Doritos and uh, Nutella, but were um, um, either you know, YouTube, which you know, um, YouTube videos are seen as, you know, well, we just look at the whole YouTube site, and that has an age profile of 90% over 16s and over. We can't say the age of a particular, um, a particular 
channel or particular content within YouTube. And again, kind of on audience, um, you know, um, even so, uh, the on even though you, on Zoella's YouTube site, 21% it was seen of, of her followers were seen as being under 16 um, because that didn't hit the 25% target ill threshold. You know, it, 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 the, the ruling wasn't upheld, even though that was hundreds of thousands of under 16 year olds. Next slide. Um, so just in summary, kind of some of the critiques of the current rules, that audience threshold of 25% not working, lack of clarity on the definitions of content. Some of these rules are hard to monitor and enforce. Getting hold of the data, particularly for NGOs and even parents is really difficult. And also there's a lack of industry-wide recognized standards or neutral sources. Going back to basics, these rules cover under 16s, not under 18s. Um, uh, and there is plenty of scope for the Advertising Standards of Authority to improve um, the transparency of its rulings, the speed of its response to the sanctions for offenders. So we've got all of that going on, and now we've got, yeah, you know, and things that we would like to push forward, close some of these loopholes, and now we actually have a new way of doing that, um, you know, which, you know, a new opportunity. Uh, next slide. And that is that uh, uh, earlier this year in June, uh, the UK government announced as part of its you know, the, new, the next stage of its uh, uh, childhood obesity plan that it would consult on introducing a 9 pm watershed on TV advertising, HMSS products, and similar projections for viewing adverts online. So we were, you know, and they would consider whether the current regulatory regime, so our, um, CAP and the ASA, is suitable or whether further you know, legislation is necessary or a new regulatory regime is needed, um, particularly looking at, into that digital space uh, and also on enforcement issues. That's what the government has promised. We're still waiting for that consultation. It's likely to come next month in December. Um, and so, you know, at the moment, UK uh, NGOs and you know, the Obesity Health Alliance Children's Food Campaign Cancer Research UK and others, uh, Jamie Oliver and others are really gearing up in our policy development uh, for you know, what would we like to be able to see, you know, what, would, what, what would we like to, be able to see, what is the answer online if we've got the nice simple call of the 9pm watershed on TV, is it a 9pm watershed online, what, you know, what are these things that are needed, um, and also, and I think particularly of interest is um, also how can we use this fact that Sky, ITV, Channel 4, you know, say that they want to see a level playing field. You know, they don't want to see the 9pm watershed being implemented on TV, implemented on TV, but if, if it is, there needs to be that similar regulation online. So we actually have some rather interesting voices stepping into this debate that we haven't had before. Um, so that's a very quick overview of of where we are and some really exciting opportunities now in the coming months and you know we, you know, we will be able to share more on that policy development side in, in the coming few months as we feed into the consultations. Thank you. Thank you Malcolm that was a, a rush through um, the UK's position and, and some of the exciting developments, as you say. Um, one question come in, which is to ask you, it's a technical question really, how they know what the age of the um, webinar, or web, sorry, what the age of the web page viewer might be. So to get 25% under 16, they would have to know the age group of the person viewing the, the pages. Um, and I just wonder if that's slightly contradictory to the... Um, previous presentation we had about collecting data from children and using it, in this case, perhaps to not advertise, but the same principle <laughs> applies. It's a very good question. And in fact, the, the, the Advertising Standards Authority and CAP recognise that there's a real problem in, in kind of you know, age gating and not knowledge, knowledge of age and the fact that many, many children you know, under, under 13 have profiles on social media um, and you know, even over 13, you know, it's still hard, you know, it's still not um, good data. So they, they say that you can't, you, know, you can't rely on that simply alone. It's, it's what, it's the combination of, you know, 
uh, ticking boxes that say, you know, we're not targeting, if somebody says, you know, their age between 13 and 16, we're not targeting them. Um, the interest group, so if they are, have an interest, you know, you know, looking at, I say, things that interest over 18s, let's say, rather than under 18s. Um, uh, and, uh, but as we know, there's a really big scope of things that are in the middle that, you know, have, you know, a, plenty of appeal to under 16s as uh, as 16 to 18 year olds and, and, and young adults uh, equally so there is a lot of gray area and um you know in effect it's a tick box exercise that the you know, the 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 regularly you know using whatever data is available either from you know, the content creators from the from, from the influencers um let's say if they they they, they trump it who their audience is uh, and others to say well here is all this data combined suggests that this is what the audience is. But but you're, you're right. There is no there is no really good hard data, and also there's no what's key is there's not any transparency in the data as well. Uh, I suppose I'm glad to hear it because it's nice to know that data on my age is not necessarily being collected either. Okay, I think we've only got uh, 15 minutes left, and I'm going to ask Sandra Radish Cornell uh, to take up the reins here. Uh, Sandra works for the uh, National Institute of Public Health in Slovenia and um, I'm hoping she can talk about her experience of digital marketing restrictions in the country um, and the exercises they've been through particularly involving different stakeholders in looking at how they can be controlling the digital marketing. Sandra over to you. Uh, hello everyone I hope that you can hear me. Yeah we can. Okay, so uh, as you nicely said, I would like to speak about Slovenian experience in capacity building to tackle digital marketing to children. Uh, I will speak more about the process itself, uh, not so much about the result. Uh, I will just briefly mention this uh, because we, what we found out is that um, process itself sometimes even more important to uh, build somehow the environment in which you are able to do some work, especially if you're trying to link and to connect uh, different uh, experts coming from really uh, different uh, expertise. Um, so I'm trying to move my slides, but it's not working well. Okay. Okay, so did I? Try it or someone do it. Ah, yes, now it's working. That was, that was you. Okay, now it's working. So, um, uh, the whole story started uh, when Moica Gabrielcic, you saw her name on the first slide um, as a national expert, uh, uh, gathered uh, people working at the National Institute of Public Health uh, in different uh, public health fields. Uh, to um, launch some sort of digital marketing initiative with uh, strong support coming from WHO country office in Slovenia. And we start to work in 2016 with uh, preparing a workshop uh, and then in the next year uh, once more. Uh, to provide a, a sort of cross-sectional analysis of uh, digital marketing communication to children. Uh, to link these public health silos and also to create joint recommendation to tackle this area. Uh, we, of course, didn't stop in 2018, but uh, in this year we, we are much more involved in some uh, international initiatives coming from European Commission and WHO. And also um, at the end of November in Slovenia, we have um, European uh, uh, Public Health Conference in which we also put uh, very high on the agenda also digital marketing issue. So um, uh, I will not, uh, I will almost skip this slide because uh, uh, Emma, I think, very nicely explain, explained why we do need to have some answers to uh, rapidly developing digital technologies and platforms, uh, uh, especially because uh, the industry recognized that these new technologies uh, give them opportunity, opportunity to um, uh, communicate uh, and to send their marketing messages uh, in very, very innovative ways and different than we saw before. So we heard about personal data collection and behavioral profiling and how to use it, location targeting, use of social media, online gaming and gambling. So um, there 
there are much uh, more opportunities for the industry to market their products than if you look 20 years ago. So these are the major reasons why um, we working on the uh, public health side need to uh, r recognize that uh, there is a whole world of opportunities uh, for industry that needs to be somehow regulated or um, at least uh, recognized uh, when we are talking about uh, our children. So the first step what uh, uh, was done at our institute is uh, recognizing the need for awareness raising uh, because we realized that a lot of public health experts and policy makers, not to say about public in general, are not aware about the issue and the problem of digital marketing and uh, even more importantly uh, the the need for uh, knowledge capacity building and uh, to link somehow different um, uh, public health fields uh, if we would like to really frame uh, and to act about digital marketing in more effective ways so, uh, as I mentioned, we had first a national workshop in 2016 and we invited uh, different public health experts from the field of tobacco, alcohol, gaming, gambling, physical activity, nutrition and also mental health. And we prepared a quite extensive questionnaire asking about all different kinds of rules, uh, laws, uh, applying to uh, channels of uh, classical and digital marketing to, to children and asking about their effectiveness. Then we had uh, a few questions around the main challenges and of course obstacles and key facilitators for improvement of the situation. And we ask also experts uh, to give us the ideas about the most promising steps forward, uh, reducing uh, uh, pressure that we can see at the moment uh, in the digital marketing to children. As I said, I will not uh, go into the detail uh, of the results, but these next three slides is just to give you, um, a, a, a sh in a short way, a picture what we were trying to um, uh, uh, got from the experts and how we wanted to get a clear picture about the background and the environment that we are working. So in these slides, uh, you can see the question about uh, regulation, co-regulation, self-regulation, then what kind of rules we can see, especially specifically in digital world, and uh, what kind of channels were, were uh, used and uh, these rules are applies to. At the end, as I said, we ask about, uh, also about the recommendation for, for further steps. But I will just uh, uh, squeeze all this information into one slide. Uh, what were the main results coming from uh, this exercise? Uh, first of all, this first is uh, quite a clear. Traditional media are much more regulated in comparing the digital media. We already expect this one. Uh, if the digital media are regulated, they are more regulated in traditional, we said traditional risk factors such as nutrition, tobacco and alcohol, much less in others like, for example, physical activity, gaming, gambling or mental health. Um, we also find out that self-regulation might not be successful or since I'm coming from the alcohol field, I can say it is not working. Now we do have quite substantial uh, evidence that it's not the right approach. We also realize that uh, political will uh, in tackling uh, digital marketing to children is very important and it's missing at the moment. Uh, at least uh, it goes for, for our um, environment or situation. And we uh, really realize that there is a clear need for intersexual cooperation, meaning uh, that it's uh, much more effective if we work together uh, from the alcohol, tobacco, nutrition, uh, physical activity, etc. sites. So we have much better chances uh, to do something um, uh, in the digital marketing uh, as whole. Well. Uh, the second one goes to the international. Uh, we know that uh, for industries in the digital marketing world, there are no borders. So 
uh, these uh, issues are very more important although we know that there are some countries uh, doing great in uh, also regulating uh, digital marketing in their own countries but it's very much connecting to um, for us uh, being in the European Union or even broader. I forgot to mention that uh, in this exercise we had also colleagues coming from Austria and Slovakia uh, and we gathered the results from their countries and they are very much similar uh, to our own. So these analyses then uh, served as a background paper for the second um, uh, workshop uh, on digital marketing to children held in October in 2017. And this one aimed uh, especially or to, to look at the methodological challenges and we try to find uh, common uh, methodological grounds that we can work uh, coming, as I said previously, from different silos. Uh, we also had here, uh, beside the public health experts, uh, government representatives, international governmental agencies, academia, uh, civil society, NGOs. So we really tried to get um, a broader group of stakeholders involved in this issue to get um, uh, a platform for, for our future work. Um, I add one photo uh, coming from, from this um, uh, workshop, just for you to see that we really had opportunity for great discussion and brainstorming. We were also, after the presentation, divided in smaller groups in which we can uh, really openly speak and ask each other and try to combine our knowledge and to get some innovative solutions and ideas for future work. So at this uh, slide, um, you can see what was identified on the second um, workshop, uh, what are the main needs to do um, uh, for uh, tackle the issue of dig digital marketing. First of all, uh, there was a focus also on ethical issues of dig digital marketing to children. We hear in previous pre uh, presentations about children's rights, so it, fit, it goes in this direction. I said already about the international and intersectorial cooperation. It was the similar conclusion like uh, uh, on, on the first workshop. Then, we realize that there is a need to develop a uniform definitions and common denominators uh, uh, in joint response of all public health silos uh, to the common challenge of digital marketing to children. Uh, there is also a need to develop monitoring system for digital marketing and definitely to update a regulation covering digital marketing to children. I think it goes for all countries because we, in most of countries, the regulation is outdated and it's not covering uh, digital marketing and all channels that developed in last few years. There is also a need to provide more resources for public health actions and to raise public awareness um, uh, in, in a broader uh, uh, public. And of course, we also realize the need to stimulate, uh, to stimulate research, to, see, uh, to hear about the exposure and impact uh, of digital marketing to children uh, in the direction that Emma uh, said in her uh, presentation. So um, I will conclude my brief presentation with uh, one sentence that was uh, heard many times during the second workshop. Uh, that uh, one is that immediate action is needed and that is what we are doing at the moment. Andrea, that's really, really excellent uh, presentation. A very quick run through what is obviously a lot of hard work being undertaken by the National Institute for Public Health, for which I have enormous admiration. You've, um, your institute has taken the lead in Europe sometimes, and certainly in the region, uh, South East, Eastern Europe, um, in building these sort of public health initiatives, um, protecting children and promoting health. So I'm very grateful for your contribution today. Uh, we're running out of time. Uh, I don't think we've had any specific questions come in um, for Sandra. So I'm going to wrap up now and thank everyone for their continued participation. We still have 30 participants online. That's an absolutely brilliant sign.
that um, we've provided something of value to somebody. So that's great. If you do have questions, as you can see on the screen now, um, get in touch with my colleague Hannah Brinsden at the World Obesity Organization. Uh, we'll be, try to answer your questions or pass them on to any of the speakers uh, who may be able to help you. So thank you very much for contributing and for listening and for participating. And we hope we'll have another webinar um, later in the year in, no, next year. Sorry, next webinar is due early next year. Um, there will be follow-ups to this. There's not only this webinar will be available online for having another look at, but we are writing a briefing paper on the topic, uh, and that is going to be a summary, really, of the evidence dossier that we are putting together. We are planning a series of evidence dossiers on policy issues, uh, soft drinks taxes, for example, marketing to children, and so on, um, which we'll be launching over the next few months. So thank you all, and I wish you all a good day. Goodbye. <laughs>